So would you believe that in the 1980s, we still had people like psychiatrists suggesting to parents that they put their child in an institution? I mean, from the 1980s, people were, were still doing this. So today you're in for a treat because we have a wonderful guest with us that's going to be sharing about his life experience um, and what inclusion means from a student. So if you're new to our show, I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm a parent, an advocate, a retired teacher. I also have a closed um, Facebook group which is a membership group. If you're interested in being with us in that group, go to the top of the page and you can see an image and um, a little button to click for details. But let's look at the state of affairs, right, for inclusion. And it is so different depending on your school district, your community, your state that you live in. But today we have Stephen Hinkle with us and you may have heard Stephen speak at a conference before. I know I first met Stephen when he was in Denver speaking at the Peak Parent Conference. Stephen and I were also contracted with Peak Parent Center to help some schools in Tulsa, Oklahoma become more inclusive. So I got the chance to work with Stephen down there in Oklahoma. And, um, you know, we've just stayed connected, and I just am excited because he has so much wisdom to share with us today. Stephen got his bachelor's in computer science in San Diego. Then he went over to Northern Arizona University and got a master's degree in special education with an emphasis on disability studies. And Stephen has some good news that I'll let him share. So Stephen, welcome. Welcome everybody, I'm Stephen Hinkle. Um, yeah. um, so I'm gonna be speaking to you about inclusion and, and, and from a student's perspective today. And I'm gonna be giving you my experience through school and some other stuff. And I just wanted to share with everybody, I was, just accepted full scholarship to Chapman University to go for my PhD. So I'm gonna start by putting my PowerPoint up here. Um, so Stephen, can you share a little bit about the backstory, how you got that um, acceptance and the scholarship that you got? Uh, yes. Can you see my PowerPoint though, Chapman? Yes, yes I do, thanks. Okay. Uh, I was over at, at Chapman University last year, and I was presenting to a disability summit, and they were so impressed that they were calling me and calling me to apply when they heard that one of my goals might be go for my PhD. And would you know it? that after doing that and applying there through everything for the normal process, I got an email from the Dean, Margaret Grogan, saying I got a President's Fellowship Award, which is recipient, which includes a full tuition scholarship plus a graduate intern position for a few hours a week. So, I was stunned, and they said it's, when I, it was even more stunned when they said it's a full ride scholarship, meaning it covers tuition for all the semesters to graduation. That you have is to pass the classes, but yes, everything is covered. And that I is was, so exciting. Yes, and I was just blown away. In fact, when I when I first got that news, I asked about what that meant. I could not. I was just. It was just hard to think for an entire hour because it was just in disbelief. It was so so real that I got that. I had not gotten anything worth that much in my life, and. Evidently, the people of Chapman believe in my future, which is very powerful, and it's very 
quite amazing, even though I'm going to have to move from San Diego up to Orange County next in the fall. I think in the end, it's going to be all worth it. Oh, exactly. Yes, we'll have to call you Dr. Hinkle soon. Here we are, Shep. <laughs> so I'm going to start now with my uh, inclusion from a student side talk. And I'm going to just going to bring it in. A, I, I'm using a PowerPoint that I used when I presented up in Nevada. So if there's any things specific, I'm just going to clarify some things I just, I, I did, honestly, I didn't, I, I just got back from New York from doing a talk down there to send data. So um, I didn't have a lot of time to customize. So I'm going to just use this. So it should be really great though. Oh, so I'm sure. I'm going to go on and just say I'm an international speaker. This is a picture of me getting my master's degree from Northern Arizona a few years ago. But I was grew up in the special ed system. And back then when I was a little boy, segregation was all too common. So I was in those classes through fourth grade. And let me tell you, they sucked. <laughs> they were absolutely awful. And I'll get to that in a minute. And I was out of there in fifth, inclusion of fifth grade. And then I graduated from high school in 1997 with, uh, with uh, my dip real diploma. And I went on to um, college. And, uh, and even to grad school after that. Um, and so forth. And then I went on to grad school in Northern Arizona. And then I've, I've traveled around for 16 years. I actually probably now, a couple years ago, uh, but probably now 17 or 18 now, I presented in 24 US states. And I also got the opportunity in 2006 to travel to Australia and advise them on their self version of self-determination called NDIS and some other skills as well. So I got to travel and it was just an honor to go around the country or even around the world. And thinking of around the world, I'm, I'm gonna do it by video and audio conference to a translator, I'm gonna be presenting and a few days to a to an audience and by 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 the, by the internet to an audience in Ukraine, so it's going to be really cool, and and I'm going to continue on. When I was a little boy, I didn't know I was different than any of the other kids. Um, I just thought I was like any other little boy, little boy growing up. Uh, it was just, well, my mom noticed I wasn't developing the same way as my brother. Uh, Jermaine, are you still there? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I am here. Um, Marlo I, had a question. She asked what it, what it takes to um, get a regular diploma. I will get to that in a minute. Okay, great. A little bit later in the talk. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, but anyway, I but anyway, I'm gonna go through my years and stuff like that. I just noticed the video was a little stationary for a second. That's why I asked <laughs> that. I just wanted to make sure we're still on. But anyway, I was in all these medical studies as a kid. It was very time consuming, very stressful. But nobody told me what they were for. But in those days, it was, I don't blame them because it was common in those days when we tell the parents what was going on, not the kids. But I was a prodigy. I could program a computer at age four. In fact, the computer you see on your thing is an old TI-99 4A, which is actually the first computer I programmed on. Back in the day, we did not have the internet or anything like that, but 
FBI was a lot of fun back in the day. So I'm recommending for inclusion. Uh, what we have to do is include kids in what's what I call the, the total school experience. And this is included to the general ed curriculum, uh, your academic classes, uh, which would be things like English, math, science, history, PE. And then there's, we have elective classes. That would be things like art, music, and drama, and shop, and home ec, and technology, and career tech ed, just to name a few. And then the school and extracurricular activities, which is also important to be part of the school experience. Uh, I'm going to be focused more on the academics today, but I still want to emphasize that that the, the fun part is a key element as well, and not something we should overlook. Um, the reality is about diversity. Inclusion is about diversity. And that is students' inclusion of all different cultures. Not just disabilities, it's also about culture. That can include people who have different ethnicities, like um, black and Hispanic and white and, uh, and African American and, and, and Native American and, and, and European and a whole bunch of others, Filipino, a whole bunch of, uh, that includes students with disabilities like any type of disability. It can be autism, cerebral palsy, hearing impairment, visual, there's the mobility, there's a other health impairment. There's about 13 different categories to go on there. It also means people who are different sexual orientations. That could mean straight or gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Can also mean uh, students from parents who are single parents uh, from their families. Can also mean people who learn uh, do English is not their home language at home, and it could mean that their, their parents speak a different language, and that can include things like Spanish, Tagalog, Japanese, Chinese a whole bunch of different other languages. Um, it can mean students who are minority. It can mean students who are poor. Not everybody lives in a middle class suburban family. There are many communities where people live that are a lot poor. Sometimes the parents don't have good jobs. Sometimes they work part time. Sometimes they get section eight. Um, that can also include kids who are homeless. And sometimes it can even mean their parents work a different shift. So sometimes they're not home to tutor the kid for their homework if they work an evening shift or a night shift or graveyard shift, for example. Uh, so we have to understand our education program to welcome all of these groups and not and design it so the richest do not always get the best, but everybody has an equal playing field, regardless of these factors. And the benefits to this is it promotes diversity. In reality, kids learn better when, when these people of different groups are part of their school. Uh, it gives them a better future. It promotes tolerance. And we all have something to give. We all have something we're not so good at. So sometimes we recognize each user's innovations that way and their own strengths and weaknesses. And that's what makes a world much more interesting as opposed to boring and, and so forth.
and we have a very high unemployment rate for people with disabilities. There's so many with autism and others that are unemployed. Um, sometimes we, our special ed graduation rate, because a lot of special ed people choose the non-diploma track when it comes to transition leading to things. So it often leads to poverty and sometimes I think depression in the, in our not when, the, when the students grow up poor in their 30s and 40s. We really have to make some changes to, to do better and aim for higher outcomes and open more doors for people with disabilities as they go through school and grow up. And we still have an epidemic of segregation, which we need to put an end to and so forth. And the reality is, can't we do better? And I think that answer is a big yes. And people would say, oh, it takes a lot of money, but quoting from Swift, what makes inclusion work, it isn't money, it is willpower. And in fact, they even show it, a video, I've seen a video where they've, where they seen it working in a very poor area of rural Mississippi, for example, and it's working great. Um, in reality, I think it costs the same or even less to include than studying segregation. But the key element here is to never put limits on people. These are pictures of people in institutions, but the key is Look at the inhumane treatment and how many people were, would, would have been given the, if they were given the chance to succeed. Well, in fact, when I was little, they told my mom to lock me away, but look where I am today. So the reality is never put limits when they're young. And like that, the person give a chance to blossom and develop their own talents, their own strengths, and see where that can lead them. For example, one of my heroes, a couple of my heroes were um, Alan Turing, who cracked a NEGPA. I was Another one is Catherine Goebel, who they thought was, was nowhere. She ended up doing the space program. Uh, another one was Temple Grandin, who, who they thought, again, had no future, but yet she was one of the best livestock handling designers in the world. We really need Stephen Hawking was another one of my heroes. So don't ever deny them the chance to to have a life of their own. And the reality is, this is a net. I'm going to talk about this little cartoon. It's from Michael G. and Greco, one of my, my favorite cartoonists in the disability field. And it's, I'm not sure why Mr. Barth always feels compelled to bring an advocate to the IEP meeting. And the reality is today, the more more you squeak, the more grease you get. It's a lot of parents have to battle every inch of the way to get what they need out of this. But the reality is, if we can make it much more seamless for the parents to get high outcomes, not only is it going to be less expensive, but it's also going to be better outcomes for all if we aim high. And, and the reality is the system is very complex to navigate. Do I still advocate for parents to learn how it works and learn their rights and also inform their kids of their rights and so forth? And again, making it more seamless. So we're going to start now with what are special ed students entitled to under the law? And the first one is a free and appropriate public education. 
And that is means that a person with is going to get um, an education that meets their needs under the law for free under the public school system. I also will point out that private schools are not required to implement this, although some of them are on their own. I've actually talked to a couple. But, but the law does apply to charter schools as well. Uh, next thing we have to understand yet is access to the general education curriculum. Under the law, persons with disabilities can access any general ed curriculum that the school offers to their non-disabled students. And what that means is I want to clarify that that is not subject dependent under the law. That means they can take English or math or science or history. It also includes uh, hands-on subjects like art and music and drama and homework and shop and all the electives you might encounter. Um, it includes early child supports, um, which means things from zero to three for the families. An IEP program, which is which allows you to customize their experience to meet their needs through a process, and I'm going to go into that in a little bit. Uh, appropriate supports and services, that means things like speech therapy, OT, PT, adaptive PE, so many other types of supports, and that also includes assistive technology things. I'll be taught, and this is important, in the least restrictive environment, which means if things can be accommodated in the regular classroom, there's no need to pull. And then supports for transition to adulthood until one graduates high school or reaches age 21. And I know in some states it's 22, or I think in Michigan it's 26. There's, there's different rules based on the state, but in many cases it's at least 21, whichever comes first. So, there's a lot under the law here. And inclusion is about being included in the regular classroom with the non-disabled peers. And to accommodate the goals of IEP goals in the regular classroom, which means that let's say, I'll just give you an example of this one. Let's say someone's goal is to read a sentence. Okay, we're to read a sentence. Can we do that in English class? What about history? What about drama? What about um, science? Wouldn't that be easy go? If someone's goal was to learn to use a calculator, could we do that in math class? What about science? I think the same would apply if someone's goal was to learn to measure things. Do it in math or science or even PE, where they learn to the distance as they run. If someone's goal was to, um, to uh, learn how to use a computer, could you do that in technology class? What about Science class? I think so, right? Oh, exactly. Yes, and and then we can accommodate other things, like even supports and services can be accommodated in the regular classroom. Like, for example, if someone is working on their speech, let's say through speech therapy, for example, what class do you think 
could could do that in I see foreign language because people are outside of their comfort zone speaking there already. What about drama where you speak on the stage? Isn't that a good way to practice? So there's a lot of ways to do this. And again, the last part is having access to the extracurricular activities. And that means going to things like sports or, or the concerts or the plays or the dances or the clubs or the, the prom or, or the after school program or some of the other or outdoor education or some of the many other types of or competitions or some of the other types of things that or the science fair or things like that. So my, my suggestion is to start by evaluating the culture of disability in your school and that means uh, are the kids with disabilities included? If they have to spend any time in a special ed room, where is that room located? It's, it's very bad to have special ed stuff support in the back corner. That sends a message of isolation. Are we able to deliver the supports they need in the regular classrooms? Are we being inclusive of that fun stuff? And are the kids' IP goals being implemented in the least restrictive environment possible, which means no pullout if they can be accommodated the regular way? And the other thing, it's about accessibility. Take over this little girl, which I found from an internet picture, which we'll call Alana. She is asking, will I be able to get to all the places in my school that my non-disabled friends love. And that means accessible rooms should not be just one classroom in the back of the school. It should be about the entire experience. Like, for example, in a wheelchair, can you get to all your classrooms? Can you get to the science lab? Can you get to the industrial art shop? Can you access the tables in those? Can you go on stage if you want to be in the play or take a theater class? Can you swim and get in the pool if that's part of your PE? Can you go out to the stadium? Can you get to the gym and be able to watch your game? Shouldn't students like a lot of have the chance to be part of their whole school experience? And Stephen, Erica asks a really good question. She's on with us. She's a parent. She says, what do I do if they have not followed our wishes with IEP for inclusion and have denied mediation? She has a nine-year-old girl who has spastic CP and feels so depressed from being unable to even go on the playground that she wishes she could freeze up forever, which and her daughter describes as that as having a seizure. So when, you know, when parents are confronted, which, you know, like blows your mind that in this day and age, playgrounds and things like that aren't accessible, but what advice would you give to Erica when her nine-year-old is using a wheelchair and she can't access different places in the school? Well, the first thing I think is is, is that school is breaking the law. I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm not, this should not be taken as legal advice because I'm not an attorney, but I will give you some advice as an advocate. The first thing I would recommend is to bring appeal if you can, uh, or maybe bring a case, um, maybe for fixing the accessibility. I think maybe you could work to raise money for an accessible playground or, for example, 
meet with the physical plant team to see what they can do about that. Sometimes those kinds of things are are handled by a different team when it comes to the school districts. And I feel very sad for her little girl because she's missing out on so many things. And I and don't give up if you lost your mediation. Try to go to the next level. I would recommend possibly getting an attorney at this point and see if there's some way to appeal this or go to the next level or bring it to a board hearing or things like that. Yeah, and I think those, you bring up really good points that, you know, once we kind of hit that roadblock, then we just have to figure out another level to go to because... The other I, option might be consider another school in the district. I hate to advise that, but to see, I'm at a poll, but sometimes things go... I hate it when they go to that level of denial. I think that that's telling me that things that the culture isn't right in that district. Yeah. And make it an offer. I would be also, if they want to hear any professional development, I, I'd be happy to do that either by travel or video conference. I would have to see what my schedule is going to be at Chapman with the courses, but. I would still be willing to present to, to help fix that if they were willing to do this. I'm not sure what city they're in, but but I'd be willing to to make that suggestion. Let yeah, me go on now. Okay, she had one out of their point. She said that they were able to get one swing for disabled, but they say that they can't put her in it because the aide is unable to lift her. So kind of excuse after excuse. There's another suggestion for someone able to lift or whatever or lift or whatever they need. That needs to be in the, when they hire the aid again, that needs to be in their job description. And someone capable needs to be hired, human resources often makes these things generic they shouldn't be right right good point in fact i'm a big believer of a job description should match the needs of the students they're going to be working with yeah that's an excellent suggestion I don't care if they're unionized or not, but I would explain to the union if it was, that was an issue that that we're going to try to make the experience better for the students. The pay may be the same in what you're advocating for, but we may make the job descriptions match the students, and it and I think that would would be in that way we can better match the person hired to better improve the outcomes. And let me go on to the next slide for a minute. Sure. And the next thing about special ed is too many school districts put their special ed rooms in the back corner of a school or the back bungalow or the basement. That's just the wrong place to put any special ed areas because that sends a culture of segregation. And not only does it send a culture of segregation, it leads to no good behavior role models for the kids. It's much better to keep them in the regular classroom as long as possible in the day. And if any time they have to go to anything for special ed areas, it still should be put in the center of the school, preferably on a wing that that kids, other kids of that 
grade level were traversed past. So they see them at passing time and at lunch and other things, because it's no wonder why in some of those schools that isolate the kids with disabilities don't have any friends. It's no wonder. And we that's something that has to change. Even if they say, oh, we need a sink or an accessible bathroom, I think the regular restrooms should be accessible. And at the same time, if they need a sink or a kitchen or something in a special ed area, why not move it over the stove ever a break period like spring break or summer break or something? Or in the new school designs, inclusion design should be the door. And then the general ed curriculum. Again, we have to look at a culture of how much are, are people with disabilities able to achieve their potential and excel during the school? And, and that is looking at how much access, and it should be full, but some cases of schools with poor practices don't have full access to the general ed curriculum. And that means all the subjects areas and even allow people to excel when they get good at a subject. Like for example, I was very good at math when I was younger and they had to get a book from the junior high when I was in elementary school. Um, and, and that means in high school, in fact, when I was a, 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 in high school, I took advanced, some advanced, really advanced classes. Like I took AP Physics, AP Computer Science, Calculus, Japanese, uh, Stagecraft, uh, Pascal and C Programming, just to name a few of the advanced classes. And we need to make sure our special ed students are not denied access to advanced level because that's how they're really gonna succeed when they get is to the, in the workforce is to develop a talent and so forth. The other thing about disability etiquette, this is our next topic. We need to make sure our coach, school's culture of disability is 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 taught. We need to make sure they understand awareness so our kids understand others with disabilities. I've been to some very fabulous days where where at some of the elementary schools where they teach kids about how to communicate with someone who's nonverbal. We teach them about sign language. We teach them about assistive technology. We teach them about different disabilities. We teach them about wheelchairs. We teach them about seeing eye dogs. I think what they need to do is to build a culture within the schools where people with disabilities deserve the respect they get and the other children understand that disability is not something you make fun of but instead adds to the uniqueness of a person and to give them the same respect that they would have about someone without, without a disability would get in the same welcomeness. If kids learn this when they're young, as they grow up, they become more accepting of this and it reduces the bullying and other things people with disabilities experience when they're raised this way. And people don't have to wait till 500 level teacher ed in college to learn how to <laughs> communicate with some non-verbals. At almost every elementary school I've, I've been to, I've had kids as young as second grade get that answer right of how to do it. 
I've had kids as young as preschool figure out how to help a kid who has no friends on the playground. Just as good answers from the preschoolers as I got from college students learning to be teachers, if you can believe it. And then the other thing with academic curriculum accommodations is our next time, is some people with disabilities in school might need some accommodations and modifications to get the supports they need. Um, and in many cases, it's possible to do this without changing the curriculum. For example, let's see somebody communicates with pictures and doesn't write very well, and you make a picture-based test, but, it, but it's about some story that a, a normal English class would read. Um, you can make the picture-based questions or the easier questions or a modification about the sto same story and the kid can listen. You can do something similar with like science where you could say, okay, Saturn is a, a planet, outer planet, B, inner planet, C, star, D, uh, a galaxy. So the kid would have to know that Saturn is one of the outer planets. But again, you can put some pictures of those things next to it. Or there's, and then we have to make sure that there's a, a variety of interventions of differentiating that people can use. They can use RTI, which responds to intervention, uh, differentiating can also adapt to multiple learning styles. Like let's say you may have some kids who are visual learners to use more visuals and other kids auditory more through sound and others kinesthetic where they would be better with through some projects. It's also possible to make the font bigger or other things or provide use of technology for those kids that use it. I know there's different views about technology in school because some philosophies are very for high tech where others like Waldorf are, are low tech, but there's still ways to incorporate that regardless of the philosophy you use to accommodate one's communication deeds. So there's different philosophies in education. Um, and that is to give them an opportunity to get an education to interest them and inclusion in different subjects. And usually the core subjects are the most critical when it comes to one's IEP. Though would be the ones like math if an English and science and history and stuff like that, but all are important. And it's important that we make sure that try to include, because one of my friends, uh, Paula Kluth, um, said, when someone is pulled from a class, you really have to consider what that kid is missing. She gave me the example in another conference, which I really love, where one of the things is that she mentioned the thing about this kid was pulled from science and social studies for more intervention. But when the test scores came out, the kid's science and social studies were very low, and it's no wonder the kid wasn't there during that period. Um, and to have things they really like. And I'm a very big believer in keeping the hands-on classes in school. And I know things with budget cuts and all these things, but I think uh, the electives give people a chance to use the knowledge they learned in the thing and a chance to use more senses. So I think that's important. And the other thing about this is, is 
The other part about inclusion is lunchtime. This is something that we often forget about. And to have inclusion during lunch, it involves letting the child pick where they want to sit and be able to talk to their friends and not just the parent or the educator professional. And I should think a kid that chooses that, not the para. And do they get a chance to uh, talk to their peers in the halls during passing time? And I'm going to see what the audience responses, and maybe you can fill me, Charmaine, to this question. Yeah. Which, which is longer? A, the number of hours in a semester for one subject, actually, no, entire school year for one subject, or the number of hours of passing period and lunch combined in a hot, typical six period day in high school. I want to see A, the semester, actually, the school year for one subject, or B, the passing time, and when we go on, just let me know what the audience thinks of that, because it is a very important question here. Yeah, yeah, I will, and we'll give them a couple minutes to respond. While yeah. we're on this slide, Lissa had a question, um, and she was saying that her son needs, you know, close supervision. And at lunchtime, I guess they didn't have that close supervision in the lunchroom. So instead of being able to eat lunch with his friends, he had to go to the principal's office to eat lunch there. So what, you know, what other strategies could you help that school with or Lisa to say, let's Here make sure that. Is what I suggest you do instead of forcing him to the principal's office. Why not allow him to have the aide with him during lunch, but the aide does not pick the conversation, but instead allows him to pick where he wants to sit with his friends. They only intervene when he does something wrong. It even may set a, a, a child or two away so that a child gets a chance to talk to their friends. The age should not be running the conversation topic. The kid should pick it. And when, when they go out at recess, the age should also pick, not the age, but the child, I'm sorry, child should be picking what game they want to play. Even if the aide accompanies them to that game, it should be the child's choice as to what game, whether it's go on the monkey bars or four square or hopscotch or soccer or, or two-hand touch football or basketball or, or frisbee or whatever it may be. I'm, each school is different as to what games they put out there on the field. Yeah, and I think in, in Lissa's son's case, the aide was had to eat her lunch at the same time the student did, so she wasn't available. But, you know, usually in lunchrooms, there's somebody walking around kind of supervising, um, you know, so, and I think your awesome. idea of, you know, making sure that her son would be with, Friends that know him, and so and he can feel supported there at the lunchroom. They have to eat lunch in another room. Let's say they're really bad or or hot for a little bit. There should always be a a process to return them at a later date. And if the lunchroom is too noisy, they should be able to invite a friend or two to come with them to lunch if they want to have a social experience during lunch. And and this is something that a lot of schools miss. And, the, and at the same time, they should not be pulled early for the convenience of a para or the convenience of the special ed teacher. 
for the convenience of the staff and isolated at lunch for that reason, just because someone special ed or the other practice I see, which is very bad, is they put the special ed table over here and all the other kids' friends in general ed over there. And that has to be, that also promotes ableism and segregation, and that has to end. And for example, let's say, say, I'll just give you an example. Let's say a little girl called Wesley wants to eat with her friends Gretchen and Amanda who are, who are in her, her math class. But her math class inclusion, and, and unless she has segregation, it, it, I mean, or it's in special ed, unless she's a special ed student, sorry. So, so how could she, didn't she be able to eat with Gretchen and Amanda? Didn't she be able to eat with her friends if they like her? and like to eat together. So that's what we have to promote. Or let's say Bob, let's say, wants to eat with his friends, uh, Charlie and Brian and David. Again, they should be able to do that. And it really is, and, and so forth. Anybody, um, but the reality is to make sure that passing time and lunch that they're socializing. And I even recommend the parents be follow a couple steps back at passing time and do not shoo the other kids away or stop them from looking at the banners for a minute or so many other things, artwork and so many other things that are happening in the halls or be able to talk to their friends like before school, after school, in the, in the halls. And the next thing about the fun side is we need to make sure our kids are included in the extracurriculars. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but to really make sure that they're considered valued members and to provide the supports they might need for the fun side, like are we providing direct instruction if a kid doesn't know how to play a game or doesn't know what a certain club is or doesn't know what to do in an assembly, like when to clap or or how to make friends or or to know know what prom is or to know how to prepare for it or get to make sure they get their, their pictures and their yearbooks or Make sure they understand how to play some of the things that happen on the fields or things or the carnivals or to make sure that our kids get invite little notes and get invited to people's houses. And when they get to high school, we should be making sure that they have a chance to date. And our kids with disabilities should never be that no kid should ever get an F minus in the hit the curriculum and to realize that it's not just not just communication, but also recreation, uh, visual and performing arts, school spirit activities, communications, conversations, manners etiquette, humor, jokes, slang, um, friendships, relationships, and then when you get to high school level and college level, you start adding dating, romance, intimacy, and sexuality to that list. So it is a really big set of skills. I just want to clarify the elementary level, they should be learning things like gameplay of the games and 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 some of the uh, how to make friends and birthday parties and some of that stuff. At the middle school level, I think they should understand the clubs, they should understand student government, they should understand get involved in those kinds of things, they should understand what a school dance is about, they should understand 
When they get to high school, they should understand things like their class officers, understand what a pep rally is, interscholastic athletic rivalry. They should understand the drama shows, the concerts, the plays. They should understand uh, at the age you should be asking someone out the whole just bang, and we should make sure that no kid fails the fun side. The next part is transportation. And we need to make sure our school buses are accessible. We need to make sure our kids with disabilities can ride to school with their friends in areas that still do the buses. And and I recommend putting the wheelchair lifts on a regular bus rather than than run two sets of buses. Again, that promotes ableism and so forth. And the other thing is we need to also evaluate the bus practices because I see too many schools still loading the wheelchair bus, dismissing them before the bell rings. 15 minutes early for the convenience of a para and convenience of a bus driver to do this. But if you really think about it, dismissing 15 minutes early adds up to half a semester for the last class of time lost when you put it together. If you can believe it, that's 45 hours. And if you think about a class being an hour long for a 180 day school year, it is 180 hours. 180 divided by four is 45. So that is needs to happen after the last bell and, and leave the kids with disabilities the opportunity to walk out with their peers that are non-disabled, and the dismissal should be in the front of the school, not the special ed bus going to the back of the school when everybody else goes out the front door. And we need to make sure bus training is about tolerance and acceptance of people with this, and this accessible buses should also be used for field trips and other things so people with disabilities can attend those as well. And, and, and to make sure that we need to make sure our transportation is accessible. Um, assessments are our next piece of inclusion. And we can make sure our special ed students are not seen as a liability when it comes to test scores. I'm not a big fan of standardized tests. I think there's too much emphasis on them, but unfortunately our states do require them. But we, what, we, what we can encourage schools to do is to make sure that these assessments and to bring it up to the teams are not culturally biased. And that includes toward gender, toward socioeconomic status, minorities, different races, disability, or influence, and do not use influences that require a different cultural background. And I'll just give you an example of that. Let's say you're asked things about the beach culture. Like, let's say I'm from California, the big beach state. But let's say you ask some questions about that kind of life. Are you gonna, you're probably gonna get good answers if you're in California or Florida or one of the other states like that. But let's say you ask the same question to kids in rural Iowa, where it's a farm culture, it's very different. We shouldn't be asking questions like that. And, and on the reverse, if you ask about farm culture, you probably get higher scores in the Midwest, like Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, or, or the Northeast, sometimes in the rural areas. 
So, um, and so forth. And the other thing about testing is we need to provide test accommodations. And that is provide things like if they need extra time, if they need larger print, if they need use of a computer, if they need um, someone to sign it to them, if they need uh, things that are reasonable, we should be providing that. And if it's in your IEP, it also applies to SAT and ACT and AP tests in high school. And I'm gonna go through the different grade levels now. Uh, pre domain. Yeah, and Stephen, I was just gonna say we're almost at the hour. So I just wanna honor your time. I know you have an afternoon appointment. Um, That's no longer. I okay, can, okay, yeah, cool. I don't have anything till two today, so. Okay. So I can go preschool uh, is about different things, uh, culture, disability, make sure you start them off right. I'm gonna go on to elementary school. Let's think about when you get on the school bus for your first time and so forth. And to build the building blocks for the key skills like English and math and stuff like that. Kids learn to read, they learn to math, they learn to spell, they learn to do things like that. And it helps to break things down into small steps and so forth, and to wonder what the, and, and so forth. And it was very helpful to type by structure when it was very there. The other thing about kids, sometimes they'll wonder what the stuff's used for. Like, when are you gonna learn to need to count or the stuff, so that's important to model. Uh, Accommodations, I think it's important that we provide the right kind of accommodations the kids need, whether it be tutoring, assistive technology, I think Braille or whatever they may need to succeed when they're in school and that we get that in place early. Um, some of the other services, again, some people need OT and PT on speech, so that's important to implement and important to emphasize. Um, when I was a kid, uh, I had trouble with reading some things. I was good at reading facts, but it was hard for me to realize things like theory of mind or inferences, and I took things very literal as a kid. So that's important. So it's important to teach both phrases, because parents with autism, they might not know like breaking something is symbolizes something else. So they might not know that raining cats and dogs, for example, they might get this picture when it when they think of someone with that phrase initially thinking cats meow, bark, 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 <laughs> and so forth. So it's important to understand or might think monkey on my back, oh it's a lot, it means a lot of work, but they might think there's a monkey on that person's back like this. Um, some other concepts that might not be obvious are relations between things, things that happen in older time periods, uh, characters, feelings, that influences, opinions of the author, things that are not in the text, they don't always get as easily, and my recommendation for this is to um, give the person a lot of background knowledge of the things, and this is the, some of the other things I had trouble with, like sarcasm and symbolisms and metaphors and implied knowledge or what happens when the camera stops rolling or things like that. That my brain didn't fill in when I was a kid. So some of the other things with facts, it's very different. So every word means what it means in the dictionary. That explains why so many with autism, for example, read facts because it makes sense to them and so forth. So um, some of the things is to test with both because sometimes the score might not reflect that. 
and understanding some different ways uh, with math, some things with are doing good. Um, some things with math, it's easier to understand some facts and stuff like this and so forth. It's technical, interactive, and understand each level is going to build like algebra, for example, builds from addition, subtraction. It was nothing more than combining rules. The only math I didn't do very well with was geometry because it was all proof. Uh, science, I recommend teaching like the lab, that, how to write up a lab. I recommend some of the physical science and so forth. It was easier to understand because it was biological, but it was um, some of the things about scientific principles. One of the things for art, I had trouble with drawing graphics. I didn't know the strokes for them. One of the studies I saw is sometimes they think about step by step when they draw, which is why so many with autism study struggle with motor difficulties, for example. Music, I think understanding things like how to read music and the lyrics and the notes and how to sing along are important and play instruments. A PE recess, I recommend things like teaching your game specific rules, like, like soccer is going to have a different rules than basketball, from, from kickball, from, from, um, and so forth. And how to team, how to form a team, like you could say Bob and Amy and Samantha and, and Charlie and David and stuff. Do you want to be on a team together? and understand your locker room and use the equipment. An elementary level is where represent easy for representing their strengths and weaknesses. And again, if someone learns slower than another, they can don't use that against them from advancing in where they're good at. After all, everybody's good at different subjects and to evaluate universal design and make sure that every learning style is implemented. This is another thing I think is happening is when kids have too much homework, they can become overstressed and so forth and to make sure that we do not overstress them and and in, in the lower grades, new studies have shown that homework does not in, more homework does not increase their progress. And I recommend at the upper grades that you limit the amount of study time in a week to about 40 hours maximum school plus homework. Because after all, there and it should be easy without a burden for parents. In the elementary school, um, differentiate if you need it and so forth. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but I think it's important to understand challenging behavior and good role models. And everybody learns with what they see or do. When I was in fourth grade, um, 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 I got out of segregation in fifth grade. But when I was in mainstream to one class, I could see the behaviors were different. And that's what got me out was getting good role models and who were doing things right rather than wrong. And some of the other things with challenging things like lack of situation knowledge, that's a key because sometimes bad behavior is caused by a child not inferring what to do in a new situation. And sometimes it's single focused and so forth. And when I was the autism, I did not generalize very well. So I had to learn each task individually and so forth. And things were not automatic. So when someone takes control, again, it puts them in a strange state. And like when someone intervenes, I didn't know the revised procedure based on what they did. It took me longer to do that. So I'm going to. Jump ahead again, it was confusing when things contradict another or get directions. So again, learning exceptions to things was not obvious when I had autism and so forth. Like, I'll just give you this example. Um, 
When I was taught, don't talk to strangers, don't get into car with strangers. So I was scared of getting into a taxi cab when I was a kid. So I had a tempo tantrum. Why? So I was doing what I was told to do by resisting, even though my mom was with me. I was doing what the school told me to do. Because I was... And then at the same time, uh, someone, uh, people need to be able to mess up and get a normal answer wrong sometimes and so forth. And then again, when I'm frustrated with things, I'm going to go and skip ahead to this, a sensory overload. Again, when someone has too much to process, it's important to stop asking for more when someone's in that situation and do not punish when they're having a sensory overload. Because again, that can create trauma. They need to relax at that point, which we often make the mistake. And then remain calm and so forth and give time to de-stress. And things what I did when I was younger, I got to um, ask for stress breaks sometimes in school or needing to leave for a minute if I got overwhelmed or things like that and so forth. And to remain calm and have patience. Oh, sorry, it went the wrong way. It's important to teach to not punish as much as one consequence is usually enough, and it's better always to teach a replacement behavior than punish in many cases. Because, again, what that does is it gives people a chance to learn how to do it right rather than be wrong all the time. And then allow the kid to explain what's wrong and investigate, rather than always say the adult's right, the cat is wrong. We need to break that philosophy and realize that sometimes the child can be right about things and so forth. And the other thing with pairs is I call error tolerance. That involves letting a kid mess up, get answers wrong, and get a normal reaction from the teacher. And sometimes they should understand uh, that it's, if it's someone just overcorrected, like what happened with one of my parents back in the day, to a point where I was overcorrected to the point where I couldn't even learn anything, I ended up getting that para fired because she was able to form a quarrel with me on this issue. And kids should, a parent should help other kids in the room when the kid they're assigned to does not need help, again, allowing the other kids to come up and so forth. And then again, listen to the kids when things are wrong and without pressure, which is important. Don't ever put them under pressure or power struggle when a kid is speaking out when they're uncomfortable and so forth. And in middle school, I'm just going to cover the upper grades for a couple minutes. Is that okay, Shermaine? Yeah, that's great. In the upper grades, I recommend um, going from middle school can be a bigger transition from someone in elementary school. You're going to have like five or six teachers. Kids, it's going to be a much more serious work environment than the, because the play stuff often goes away. And there's many other facilities like auditoriums and science labs and other things that are specialized and changing classes. So that was hard for me to get used to no recess. It was hard to get used to knowing my way around. I think it's important to familiarize them with all their rooms. And the understanding reports and how to write them, because I was not a very good writer as a child, so I think it's important to teach them that and to help them with the work so they can get this. And again, group work is a big thing in middle school now. And again, to get in, to know the other children you can talk to to understand how to get to know them and stuff like that, and how to cite and form other longer contests and, and things with writing, I think is important to emphasize. Um, things are going to do that in English class and science 
history class, science class, some of the things you may have to write more and to teach them how to do that. And once another thing with math in middle school, again, algebra is now required, but it's not impossible. If someone can add, multiply, subtract, divide, algebra is not that difficult. The other thing I think in reading that's important is to teach the structure of stories to look for exposition, to rise, to climax, and then go back down. One time I had an English teacher teach me how to break down a story. It was very helpful to know how to do that. It made the assignments in English so much easier once you learn that. Um, uh, Algebra is there, and the key with combining rules, again, that is key, that gets you through math a lot. Another thing that's harder with math is to show all your work. Someone's writing's higher. I did it on a computer eventually, but I think it's important because I, when I was younger, I had trouble with writing everything out. Sometimes I could do things in my head, but they wanted to see every step of the way. Um, that was harder for me. Um, another thing is to use different procedures for this and to really work on things at this level. Uh, another class that comes into in the middle school level is history. And I made no connection between ancient civilizations and today. So that's important to not teach about what the significance is for this. And I think when they get to middle school, I would recommend giving them more input into their IEPs, getting all their things, get all their accommodations there. And then when they go on to high school, I also think we should, should not cut them off at ninth grade on functional skills without giving them a chance to try. The other thing about this, I love this quote from Adam Savage. This is electives and why we should never leave them behind. And this is his quote. If you want to bring the kids' test scores up, bring back band and bring back shop and get kids actually learning stuff instead of teaching them how to take a test. I think schools should be bringing the hands-on classes back and expanding the offerings and teach kids how to be creative. In fact, one of my friends who works as a mechanic said uh, he can't find very many skilled people because they cut all the industrial arts classes. And 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 and, and we need kids uh, didn't know how to do some of the things at home. And I think the hands-on classes are also a lot of fun for kids. And how well worth with all the school rallies of funding and all this stuff, this is something else we should advocate to come back. And again, core subjects are also important in middle school and important to understand, differentiate and stuff. And again, the social experience again of middle school with the clubs and the science there and all that stuff is important. And these are just some of the things I've had to use the upper grades. I had to use a laptop. I had to use some other assistive technology. But again, some people, each person's needs are different. With any technology device, a person must accept it. You can't just say give somebody a Dynabox or give somebody an iPad or give somebody a, a laptop or whatever, they have to understand, think it's useful. They have to know how to be, use it, be trained, and so forth. And then again, some of the accommodations at middle school for testing at extra time and break times and work for things like assignments and group work. Again, can you understand how do you work in a group? How do you divide the roles? I had some trouble with this. I didn't know how to do it till high school, till I got involved with drama and tech crew and stuff like that. I finally made some friends. Again, there's modifications like if they need a different curriculum or if 
things like that. You can accommodate some alternate tests and assignments. Um, if they need to have input into this and run the levels. Now I'm going to just go through high school very, very fast. But I think it's important to understand when they're usually about 14 when they start here. And it's usually a big turning point for your child because usually the decisions you make here are going to impact their early years of adulthood. The workload is a lot harder. The kids are under a lot more pressure for all the testing requirements and where they're going to go to college. And again, they're becoming more grown up. They think they're an adult, which of course are not, but but they do have a lot more privileges as a teenager. And again, social scene. And again, there's much bigger campuses, sometimes a lot more crowded, sometimes the workload's harder. Uh, sometimes like the English class of literature, sometimes it makes math of algebra two and geometry, sometimes uh, science like chemistry and physics, sometimes um, the whole bit. But again, most high schools, and I know each state is different, but I know this was when I originally did the PowerPoint in the uh, school district in Nevada that I'm using, that was their requirements, but each, but they're usually very similar, usually so many years of English, so many years of math, so many years of social studies or government, so many years of history, so many years of math, so many years of science, so many years, usually there's an arts requirement, a foreign language, a health credit sometimes, computer tech. And again, a lot of this child to pick the courses to interest here. And usually there's a lot of electives at the high school level to choose from, whether it be art or drama or home ec or shop or or ROTC or tech ed or, or, or career ed or all kinds of things. It really depends on the school, what they offer. But again, I recommend taking the courses they're capable of. Don't ever limit their potential and to provide the right supports. Again, if someone wants to go to for a diploma, don't restrict them to a functional skills as an assumption. And then again, five paragraph essay is a key and chain of command if they have a problem with somebody or get made fun of. And teach how to break down a project into smaller steps because a kid sometimes might have trouble with the larger projects and how to break them down and manage their time and things like that. And again, some of the math skills and how to do science labs and write ups and that kind of stuff you get in high school. But then again, let the kid pick something they really interest. Like I've seen many, when I was in high school, I took stagecraft and learned how to work the tech crew. I did computer science. I, I enjoyed going to the dances once I finally learned how to dance in 12th grade. The deficit was actually dancing, not not speech, and the violin was hands on. I I know stop class was done sometimes. There's just some different things they can learn at the high school level. Now I'm going to skip over this, but I think because I don't know if I have a video file on this computer, but it's a something about I saw a video online of kids who didn't know how to fry an egg. I found a whole bunch didn't know how to change a tire. We need to bring back uh, family and consumer science and industrial arts into the curriculum. And this is so important to not forget the fun and to make sure each kid has a chance to succeed socially as well as academically. And then I want to finish with one more more thing. When they get up to high school, to really think about where they're going to go in transition and to really understand whether they want to do the track or not. 
because the reality I would like to point out is the job market situation today is very different than the old days. The number of jobs and entry-level positions in stores is declining. If you've seen Dan Bell or Ace's Adventures, when you see how many malls are going out of business, how many retailers are going out of business, it's very hard to support you on a minimum wage salary or shelter workshop. So what I suggest is that every person expand on their talents, use their strengths to guide them, and to do not limit potential. Because if a kid wants to go to college or things like that, people are, that's becoming a more popular option. And we can, if you expand on talents and strengths and use that to guide them to their career, and expand on training beyond high school, whether it be college or learn a trade or whatever, they can go on to have a quality life. And people with disabilities today, I know some have gotten married, some have had their own children. It's we need to make sure that we do not jeopardize their path to success when they get to high school and beyond, and to really give them a chance to succeed and be able to complete the journey through preschool, through grad school, so they're out in the adult world, so they have a chance to, to go on to a career they really enjoy, to be able to, have, be able to find life in the community that they enjoy, with the people they want to live with, and be able to have a school experience that not only academically prepares them for the world, but the opportunity to fill their picture book full of memories of their childhood and be able to, to, to show that to their, to their children and their grandchildren when they grow up and that we make sure that they can do that inclusively and we can remove the barriers of segregation and exclusion, replace it with inclusion and a path to success, regardless of a person's abilities. And, and I want you to spread that and make that seamless for the next generation and to, to make sure that, that it is to the next generation can have that chance, a better chance than the previous, and to really look back and have an experience that lasted a lifetime. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Stephen. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, then you can co come for full screen for everyone to see. I just, you know, I think in this, presentation that you just did there is such a wealth of, um, you know, practical things that parents can do in teachers, but also the wisdom that you have learned from your life. So yeah. I so appreciate it. I Jean, can take a question or two. Yeah, Jean had said earlier in your presentation when you were giving a, an example of a student writing a sentence. So Jean had asked, can you talk about how to modify and support so a child working on sentences can do this in the typical environment? Uh, yes, think about, first think about every place you can do this and you can make those assignments where they learn to write their sentences or whatever, part of some of the assignments they do and based on some of the things they're learning, that's an easy way to do that. But if you think about English class, I'll just use that as an example. You'll read something and you'll write something or something. You can have them write a sentence about something they've read in English. You can have them write about a scientific principle in science. You can have them do that in in and that's something learned in history, in history class. Think about how many other classes. You can have them speaking on stage in drama class. You can have them do it in 
almost it, a number of other classes as well. Basically, the technique is to think about where that can be used and incorporate that goal in there where it can be used. In fact, one of my things with, like for another example from public group that sequencing, a history teacher in high school uh, said, I'm going to just think of some examples of history that teach sequencing, have a kid do that. And it can be about what's being lectured or taught that day. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying is so true that we need to look at how many different classes we can, you know, review and teach that that one skill. So the child is relearning that all the time throughout his day. Um, and if you and look at the infused skills squid, which I've seen. It's easy to see how many X's go in those boxes with the classes on one side and then the skill they're learning on the other axis. Anytime you see a put an X in it, it's, it's just amazing how many can be. Um, yeah, that is like the infused skill grid or IEP goals is like such a, a cool tool. So if you don't know about that, you could just put in um, IEP grid and I can give you a link for a sample of it. One of the other things that we're doing in our membership group um, is I'm doing a transcription of our live videos and I go through and highlight the key concepts that, um, you know, in this case that Stephen has made because, like I said, it's just like incredible all the the goodness that you have shared with us. So if you'd love to be a member with our Parent Advocacy Trailblazers, you can click on the link at the top on that image that says click for details. And your transcription will be coming your way because um, I think that what Stephen has shared with us today not only would be so valuable for you to share with other parents, but your IEP team, your school, um, and Stephen, do you want to show your contact info one more time, that last slide? Stephen is also available to be a consultant in your district. He, you know, will do presentations for staff, presentations for other students or parents. So um, keep Stephen in mind when your school is looking for, you know, some kind of professional development activities because he'd be an awesome resource for your school and your school district to use. So there's his uh, mailing address and email. So thank you again, Stephen, and congratulations one more time for getting that full ride <laughs> to your PhD program at Chapman University in Southern California. And I just appreciate you and, um, all the gifts that you continue to share with us. So thank you once again. Okay, thank you so much, Charmaine, and it was great to have me on the, free to be on the program with you today. Yes, and so for our viewers and people watching the replay, know that this replay of this um, video will stay up on my Facebook page. I'll also put it on my YouTube channel. But please join us every Thursday. Um, usually we're on at noon Mountain Time. Occasionally we um, kind of tweak that time. But I would encourage people to like our Visions and Voices Together Facebook page and get notified when we're going back again <laughs> next Thursday for our next show. Okay. So until then, everybody have a terrific week and weekend, and we shall see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Sounds good. Bye. Let's sign off now? Or? Yeah, so I think if you stop sharing, then I can see the button. I'll click. There we go. See you next Thursday. Okay, thanks.